Yeah, ran, ran 21152, which was uh, a little bit over a four minute personal best. I came from the mud, desert on my hands, strong like a tree, there's roots where I stand, gone to sleep this night. Um, gonna go for a run at eight o'clock in two hours. <laughs> And then we're going down to the expo. We're gonna meet uh, some Garmin people. It's Garmin uh, sponsoring our team now. And uh, yeah, that's really all it's on the docket for today. Get our water bottles ready, go to the tech meeting, and just chill out. Yeah, Hayden Hayden would have been the fifth guy. 20, 25th. What did he run? Let's see. Damn, we got first and we're, we got 10 guys in before. We have 11 guys in before another team has five in. Really? So you're first and second? Uh, well, not even. We're first and fourth. First and sixth. First and fourth, I think. That's what Jacob said. Well, it's, ad it's adjusting now as other teams come in. It's still adjusting, but. We definitely, we definitely oh, yeah, won, though. Okay, good. Yeah, we're actually not. We're first, though. Let's get okay, okay. First and <laughs> sixth now. Because other teams have, like, Oh, uh, low sticks, but they didn't have a fifth man in. I gotcha. Okay. All right, I'll let you go. That's my touch base. All right, yeah, I'm getting ready to go do a uh, pre meet, and then I gotta go over to the expo. All right. Good luck, man. I won't, we won't bother you anymore. Yeah, they ran good, though. Yeah. Is it shitty out there? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty muddy, yeah. yeah okay. Pretty muddy. So, all right, see you, bye. All right, see ya. What just happened? Uh, our boys teams won AAU Nationals. I'm Jacob Thompson. I'm Matt Lottom. And we run for Mission Run Dark Sky Distance, uh, Under Armour team based in Flagstaff, Arizona. I would recommend training for anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks for your first marathon. That way you can kind of gradually build up over time uh, and get in all the important workouts that you can get in. 14, running for Under Armour Mission Run, Mission Run Dark Sky Distance, Matt Lano. So we'll get bottles roughly every 5K. Um, there's six stations throughout the race, pretty evenly uh, spread out. So yeah, we just put our uh, stickers, name tags on them, and then we drop them off like at each, or they take them, uh, and we, they go to each location. Uh, and then I'll take roughly, uh, Try to get in about 100 calories a bottle. So yeah, I just use Morton 320. Um, the middle two, I use caffeine. So I get like a little caffeine kick in the middle of the race. Um, and yeah, really that's all it is to it. I like these little bottles because they fit in my hand really well and they have the sport lid so they're super easy to, to squeeze out and they're clear so you can see like how much, uh, how much you have left. So I put about 10 ounces in each one, and I try to make sure I drink at least uh, eight ounces. So if there's a little bit left at the bottom, that's totally fine. Uh, just kind of gives me a little little margin uh, for air. And yeah, that's kind of my, my fueling strategy uh, going to the race. No, I actually don't take gels. Uh, I'll carry two gels with me just in case I drop a bottle um, or I feel like I need it in a pinch or something like that, but uh, I'll take the gels, uh, I'll take two before the race. So I'll take one with breakfast and I'll take one about 30 minutes out from the race.
Those cap me. Oh, uh, yeah. Get mixed in real good. It's flat the rest of the way, right? Yeah, it flattens out at 20, really. If you have legs and things feel good, that might be a good place to, to move a little bit, you know? Try to start testing people and see, see where everybody's at. But I really think people are gonna, gonna really be packed up and stay together. Yeah. So if that group starts splitting off, we can go with the 65 group. Like if there starts to become two packs. Yeah, I think that's, I think you're ready for that. I also think, I just have a hunch it's gonna be, I'll prefer it be one group of people looking at each other for a little while. Yeah. A little last minute course preview. Dude, I slept surprisingly well last night. Yeah, I was probably asleep before 9 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. Wear that long sleeve and hold it up at the start. I do. I have like a light jacket in here too. Yeah, the only jacket I brought is just like $300 Gore-Tex jacket, so I'm not gonna toss that. <laughs> Still like 50% chance of rain the whole time. It's like it's like in a, it's like two hours. Shouldn't you know if it's like yes or no by now? Like how's this 50 50? I tried to make all my decisions last night, so I didn't have to make any decisions today. Like I got two pairs of gloves in here, I got two pairs of socks. You know, just pack one so I know what I'm going to wear. Going into to CIM, you know, I, I was really confident. I think that's something that uh, I maybe like didn't allude to in the, in the previous episode, just because I know how humbling the, the marathon can be. And uh, especially like when you're trying to train at that, kind of really pushing that uh, razor's edge of, of training, like so many things can go wrong or you could get sick or injured or uh, so I, I didn't really want to jinx myself, but I knew if I made it to the starting line before, you know, I got sick or, or any injury popped up that, uh, I would be prepared to, to have a, you know, a, hopefully a breakout performance. Uh, and that was definitely kind of in my mind the whole time building up into the race. The horn is fired and the racing is underway here at the California International Marathon and the USATF Marathon Road Championships. And then, yeah, we get to the start line and, you know, marathon is kind of like interesting because you're not uh, as like gassed up for you are for like a track race where, you're, you know, you got to be really warmed up and like ready to go. Like, you know, it's a long race and I think controlling yourself mentally uh, that first half of the race is, is really important because uh, you don't want to waste too much emotional energy. And so that's one thing, you know, I was just almost pretending like, hey, I'm going to get ready for a workout here. I'm going to run the first 13 miles with these guys. I'm not going to do anything stupid. And then like, once we hit halfway, I can like really start thinking and treating this like a race and going into the race, I would say my, my race plan, uh, it was definitely to, to race with the leaders. Like I wanted to go in and, and compete for us title. Uh, we'd kind of said early on, if, if one person goes, or maybe even if two people break away really early in the race to just let them go, um, knowing that, you know, the marathon is, you know, it's a two plus hour race. It's going to, we're going to have time to, to bring them back in, um, as the race progressed. And that's pretty much how it played out. So, so Brendan kind of went off the front, uh, straight from the gun. He got a big jump on us through 5k even. So our first 5k split is 15, 24 for the leader, the defending champion, Brendan Gregg, the local from West Sacramento. Looking down the list, Roddy in six, Shaddy B. Watt down in eighth position Nick Thompson in ninth I think he was 15 or 20 seconds up through 5k and it's like was that a huge mistake to let him go like those those thoughts definitely went through our 
or went through my mind. I'm assuming they went through my competitors' minds as well. Um, but I knew we had like a strong group of guys who were, were capable of, of trying to reel him back in. Uh, if that did happen, I think it was important for us. We kind of, a couple of us kind of chatted. And we're like, hey, if he's still away at, um, you know, around 30K, like let's do whatever we got to do to call him back in. Um, so I think knowing that other people were on the same page made, made me feel a little bit more confident as well. Uh, but then, yeah, the, yeah, the, fir the first half of the race, like all I was really thinking about was like, getting to each aid station you know every 5k getting my bottle down get my fuel in uh just staying as as smooth as as i could going into it i was all right with kind of anywhere from 65 to 66 minutes uh through halfway i didn't really want to go under 65 through halfway and i didn't really want to be slower than than 66 so you know we actually came through in, in 65 36 so it's kind of like perfect and we ran really even for that whole first half. Um, and then our, our second half uh, ended up being, I think we were 66, 16 is what my second half. Uh, so about a about a 40 second uh, positive split, which I think on a course like that, like, you know, we used a lot of those downhills early in the race. And then once it became kind of clear to us that we were gonna catch, that our group was gonna catch uh, the leader, it kind of became a cat and mouse game of people not really wanting to lead. So some of those uh, later Ks, I think, were uh, miles were probably slower than than they could have been if we were just, you know, going strictly for a time. But, you know, there was a U.S. championship on the line, and I think everybody kind of had that in the back of their head. They didn't want to, you know, extend themselves or, or do a lot of the, the heavy work. Uh, and kind of those, you know, fifth mile 15 to 20 uh, of the marathon work can definitely be pretty pretty grueling to do so. He does have to hold on to it because that group of five behind him, they aren't going away, as we said. And there's five athletes right there that are very, very good. And they are all racing for the win, not just for fast times. I mean, they've all run fast times. They want to go and, and get a win. So, you know, when you have a guy like Daniel Mesfin right there leading and a Jacob Thompson who is just knocking at the door of being a really good marathoner uh you know you have puts and zenith lassi who we've seen so do so well over the half marathon distance the further we got into the race past halfway the more confident i got that i i wouldn't i wasn't going to blow up and i wasn't going to hit a wall um that's kind of what happened you know thinking back to chicago in my marathon debut i definitely had that in the back of my head um because i felt really good for about 16 miles in chicago and then i i started to hit a wall really hard and there was there was no coming back once that happened uh, so the farther I got, the, the more confident I got that that wasn't going to happen. Cause I, I felt so much better, uh, than I did at, at Chicago. And, you know, I think that's something that we've kind of pointed to in this video series a lot is just, I just feel way more prepared. I've done kind of the callousing work with my body. You know, I've done marathon training for, you know, an extra 14 months. I've put in a lot of those like longer runs that I, I didn't get in, uh, my first marathon buildup. So I, I definitely took a lot of confidence from those, you know, all those two plus hour runs that we did, um, especially knowing that most of them were kind of like workout type efforts as well. It wasn't any one workout that I did over 16 weeks, but it was kind of like the whole body of work over 16 weeks. It was the, you know, every nine days we were doing a long run, uh, you know, two hours to two hours and 20 minutes where we were doing like a lot of, of steady work, uh, you know, in there building up to 25 miles. And I think that's something that really you know, calloused my body and, and made the marathon honestly feel feel really good. Once we hit uh, halfway, I was I was starting to get a little worried that I was going to have some stomach issues. Uh, I'd kind of thrown up one of my bottles that I had taken of, of Morton, uh, and then yeah, the further we got into the race, like I knew <laughs> I knew something was going to have to happen. So yeah, like right past 25k, I uh, stopped for a, a brief moment to. Uh, relieve myself and I actually ended up catching back up to the group uh, within the K between 25 and 26 K uh, and, and yeah I think I, I looked back and I ran like a 503 that mile uh, even with a, a short little bathroom break in there and I was really worried that like once I caught back up that you know that might have taken I might have tried to made up that that gap too fast or I might not have you know things might start falling apart at that point uh, so I really just focused like on one K at a time for the next two or three Ks. And yeah, I really just kind of got my momentum back. And the farther I got into the race from that point on, like the more confident I got. And then, so that was probably, that was right around mile 16. Around mile 18, like all of a sudden, Brennan was just 
just he was just right in front of us. Look at Brendan Gregg here now. You can see people closing in. Things changing here quite demonstratively in the last mile or so as this lead group of runners in the chase back includes one Australian in the group here that we mentioned a few times, but the uh, the quartet of Americans now trying to close the gap as they come through, what, that's 30K, I think, is that timing, Matt, as they come across. We'll confirm that here in a moment, but uh, boy, that lead has disappeared in a hurry. His biggest lead was 44 seconds, I think the announcer said. Uh, and that was probably yeah, right around mile 14 or 15. Um, with a course like CIM, it's a lot of long straightaways, so we could we could see him. It wasn't like he was you know out of out of sight. Um, and a couple of us kind of chatted like, hey, if he's still if he's still out at 30k, like let's start really working to to reel him in. Um, but we we're you know we were pretty content to just keep running you know five minute pace. Uh, and not do anything drastic to try to reel him in all at once. And then, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, I think his lead went from, from 40 seconds to, to 10 seconds in like two miles. And then, uh, you know, once all of a sudden he was like right in front of us, it was pretty inevitable that we were going to catch him. Understand that they are going to get him, but what do you do when they get to you? That group of four American men in Jacob Thompson, Daniel Mesfin, Futsum Senesalasi, and Joel Reichow as they close in here on the leader, Brendan Gregg, our defending champion here at CIM. Jacob Thompson, we have to just talk to, talk about him. I mean, he has, you look at his CB right now and he has PB after PB after PB this year. He's run 102.25 for the half marathon. And that was way back last, in February. And then he ran a PB in July over the 15K. He ran a PB over the 8K. I mean. All of the distances, he's got a PB, and it's really fun to see that he's coming into his own. Yeah, the All-American at Kentucky was third at that half marathon distance, eighth at the 10K, 10th at the 15K, was 17th on the track at the USA final at 10,000 meters, and back to that performance in Chicago, his PB in the marathon, 215.49, was 12th in Chicago in that race. Now he is trying to lead this group back Let's see if they come and do that or whether they just come and join him and just check in and see how and how he's doing. No, I think they're going right by. I mean, they, you know, now it's up to Brendan to figure out how to to latch back on. And, and it looks like the guys are going much faster than Brendan at this point. But Jacob Thompson, like he went right by, as you said, he really made an effort to pull this group along and he did not make any move to just kind of say, here, Brendan, come along. He put it on him or he went by him and put it on, and he definitely is trying to put a surge here and break this race up. Um, and that definitely, that was like right around mile 19, so, you know, we still had seven miles of, of race to go. Uh, you know, so you're looking at 35 plus minutes at that, at that point. But that was kind of like a big signature, like, all right, everything's starting to trend in the right direction. Our chase group had, had dwindled down a little bit. I knew there was four or five of us left, and at that point, I kind of started leading and, and trying to put in a charge from there because uh, I was I was really confident going into the last the last 10k. But Thompson looks very good and very confident right now out there in front with Daniel Mesfun, put some Zenasalasi and Joel Reichel as they continue to race for a USA title. And yeah, our group ended up staying together. I think we got down to to four guys, um, and then once we got on to to J Street, you kind of count all the way from from 50, it's 50 something, all the way down to A Street, where the final turn right before, like 200 meters before the finish line is. Uh, and so every intersection, you're just seeing number after number after number. And uh, people had warned me about that before the race that you're like, hey, it's several miles of you just counting down, you know, from 50, whatever, all the way down to eight. Uh, and I actually kind of tried to use that. Like, I, that's one thing I do in running. Like when I break it down, like I'll look at a telephone pole or I'll look at a street sign or something like that. So like I was just trying to, I was mentally just counting down each street as I went down. You know, I like that they're together now and they're in this big pack of guys and hopefully they can just get through these, these really hard miles together and then that get that race going again the last few miles. Jacob looks good right here, Paul. I mean, he's been pushing now the last few miles. 
still getting his fluids in, you know, just looks really smooth. Zenoslossi right behind, kind of, you know, setting in like third in that pack here. Zenoslossi has such a great pedigree over the half marathon, as we said. Uh, then it was down to Futsum, Daniel, and myself. And uh, right when we hit 23, uh, Futsum took the lead for the first time in the race. Uh, he, you know, he was content to kind of just sit right behind our group uh, for the first 23 miles. And yeah, when he made his move, he, yeah, it was a textbook move like you want to make in road racing. I think he ran uh, like a 438 is what he told me. He ran from 23 to 24 and that really broke things open. Mike dropped kind of 5K from 35 to 40K, sub 15 minute 5K, the fastest of the day, 14.59 for Futsum Zena Selassie. 46 seconds faster than the leaders were running from uh, kilometer 30 to kilometer 35. So a blistering move by our leader on the men's side and he is closing in on the state capital and the finish line. Finally, we see Thompson come through. He's now alone in second. So not only did that move by Zena Selassie break up the lead pack, but now the lead pack is broken up entirely with a, an 18 second difference between Thompson and Mesfin in second and third, Joel Reichow trying to hold on. And I, I thought at first maybe it would be like, you know, something where he, he surged really hard for like 400 meters and then settled back into five minute pace. So when he made the move, I, I really kept an eye on him to see if that gap was gonna continue growing or if it was something that, you know, maybe he gets a five or 10 second lead, but we still have three miles to go and uh, we can kind of try to chase him down those final, you know, final mile or so. Um, but yeah, he put he put the I mean, he put 40, 50 seconds on us in uh, in three miles. So yeah, he was he was definitely kind of waiting to make that move. And you know, props to him. He he made a very strong move that, that nobody could match. Um, the big thing for me once he made that move was like to stay mentally focused because like you know I still wanted to have the best race I could have. And you know, there were some guys I was with at that point with three miles to go who still you know you know might maybe finish two minutes back. So you know, the marathon you can cough up a lot of ground really fast if things start going south. Uh, so I started just locking in, making like really focusing on my form, making sure like my arms and my knees and like everything was, was going the right way. And like my form wasn't breaking down at all. Um, and I, I ran really consistent. I basically ran right at like five Oh pace, um, for those last couple miles. And then, uh, yeah, it was a long stretch. Once I got by myself, ran the last two miles alone. It was the first time I'd been alone the whole race and, yeah, I was just waiting to get to 8th Street and make those final two sharp corners and, uh, and yeah, see the finish line. We had the 26 mile marker uh, and there was a sharp right turn right there. And when I made that turn, I looked over my shoulder and, you know, saw that I was, I was plenty clear of, of third place. So I knew I'd kind of locked up, uh, you know, as long as I could get through the last two or 300 meters. All right. I was going to, going to finish second. And, you know, at that point I still really wanted to break 212. Um, so, you know, I kept pushing all the way through the finish line and yeah, I ran, ran to 11.52, which was uh, a little bit over a four minute personal best. It really gives me a lot of confidence kind of going into 2023 and, you know, now this whole next year is kind of all, all about what do we have to do to, to get an Olympic time, uh, Olympic qualifying time and to be ready for the trials in early 2024. Second place. Uh, a four minute PR. Uh, yeah, it was a tough race. I mean, I felt I felt really good. And then I think the last 3K was longer than, uh, or the last two miles was longer than the first 24. But uh, yeah, I just kept waiting for that turn. And then I got to the turn and finished it off. So all the work we put in flex, that paid off today. In second place, running for Under Armour, ties the ninth fastest time ever on this course. A massive lifetime best in 2.11.52. He was a standout at Kentucky. Second today, Jacob Thompson. Woo! Took us three hours to find a beer after the race. But we got one. So we've talked about the nine day cycle versus the seven day cycle a couple of times. And I think that's something that really helped me in this buildup. It's the first time I've ever done it. And it kind of allowed me to take, you know, instead of trying to cram like a really intense buildup into, you know, 10 or 12 weeks, um, it kind of allowed me to, you know, space out 16 weeks 
allowed me to to get in all those like hard long runs um you know if you're going seven days and you're doing a, a hard workout on friday it's really hard to come back saturday and sunday and still have the quality uh in the long runs that you want to have so you know i i definitely in, in my coaching like it's hard uh for you know for people who have a regular schedule like the weekends are really important to them for for training so it's hard to get them on a nine day cycle but if you have that luxury of uh you know, being able to train whenever you want to train and, you know, the days of the week don't necessarily have to define your, your running calendar, I would definitely recommend trying it because I think it, it allowed me to get better recovered, allowed me to get more intense, like, with my workouts and put more volume into those days. And, yeah, it really allowed me to have those quality long runs that um, I think is, you know, the most important thing for the marathon. With 2022, like, coming to a close, I, I do think that this wasn't a year that I PR'd on the track. But it is a year that I think, you know, 15, 20 years, I'll look back and I'll say like 2022 was a very important uh, year for me because I really stepped up to the marathon distance. I stepped up to the roads. Uh, my training was as consistent as it's ever been. Um, you know, I've got some of the highest finishes at every U.S. road championship uh, that I went to. And you know, I, I'm, I'm taking a lot of confidence out of this year. Um, and it is kind of, I think this year was like probably the beginning of that next chapter, uh, of running for me, which I guess you could say started kind of at the end of 2021 when I ran the Chicago marathon, uh, just a little over a year ago. But I think like, yeah, now I have a lot of confidence on the roads and when I line up on a road race, like or when I line up at a major marathon or I line up at an Olympic trials race, I'm I'm confident going into it, and I I know that I have what it takes to do that now. I'm really appreciative of of the Flagstaff community. You know, I've been out here for uh, a little over a year and a half now, and you know, I've loved every minute of it, and really appreciative of, of Under Armour. You know, I started uh, this year unsponsored and signed with signed with Under Armour in January, and I think we had a great first year together. And you know, I think the the team, uh, you know, our team Dark Sky, and you know, with Stephen Hass and, and Pat Casey, like. I think they're putting together a really good team that can compete internationally and compete to make teams anywhere from 800 meters all the way to the to the marathon. And uh, I don't think there's a lot of teams out there that are trying to do it with that big of range um, with, you know, athletes from from all different countries. Um, so it's really awesome like to be a part of. Um, I've definitely learned a lot being out here and, you know, I can't wait to see what what 2023 holds for the whole team and then obviously rolling into 2024, everybody getting ready for that next Olympic push.